he's talked to a broad variety of people around the building, the Expressway people, the Gene Cloud people, uh, obviously Personograph. Um, he's beginning to talk or has talked with the Wind Maven people. Um, and I, I just met with him yesterday and, and he showed me some of the stuff he's working on, which I think is extremely cool. And uh, I'm just amazed at how quickly he's come up to speed and taken a lot of input from a lot of different groups and crystallized it into a single architecture that I think is awesome. Uh, he just joined us a few weeks ago. He had his own startup in the automotive IoT space. Before that, he was in the semiconductor uh, manufacturing equipment business. Uh, he has graduate degrees from Kansas State and undergrad degree from India and is an awesome, really cool, smart guy, and I'm personally really happy to have him here. So he's going to talk about his experiences in the IoT. Uh, I'm sure he'll be back later to present his architecture to the whole group. Thank you, Jadav. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so really happy to be here at, at uh, Intertrust. Um, like Jadav said, I started my career in the manufacturing, semiconductor equipment manufacturing space. A uh, few years ago, I started my own company with uh, doing a, basically a connected car solution and targeted that toward, towards consumers and realized how difficult and finicky consumers are. So then sold that at, into a company that was doing industrial IoT, so I spent the last couple of years on industrial IoT. So what I'll talk about today is primarily a fairly high-level presentation on what is IoT and then kind of focus a little bit on industrial IoT. So the focus will be really talking about how does this pertain, what is industrial IoT, what are they looking for, the needs of that, in, uh, of that space, and what does a platform in that space look like, right? <coughs> so if the presentation is too high level, tell me to move forward, I'll, I'll just skip forward. If you have questions, feel free to stop me at any point, uh, no issues with that. What is IoT? I mean, I think the most common definition is it's all these billions of devices that are, uh, that are basically connected that collect and transmit data via the Internet. And that's a classic definition of IoT. Uh, there's quite a few devices that you're familiar with and a few that you probably are not as familiar with. Right? So smart watches, Nest thermometer, um, smart bulbs, some people are starting to use them. But Autonomous driving trucks, uh, cars that are constantly sending data, retail spaces where they install beacons and they can detect people as they go in and out and really get a heat map for how many people are going into a store and what part of the store they're visiting, right? This is, I love this example. This is, uh, uh, basically it's a street lamp. And this is being deployed now in London as we speak. And this lamp, it looks like a traditional lamp from 400 years ago, but it's got about 20 sensors built into it. Everything from sound sensor, water sensor, humidity, temperature, it's got a little call button where you can call and talk to somebody. Um, the displays change, I mean, it's digital displays. It's just unbelievable what just a, just a, a street lamp can do for you. So, a lot of examples, and if you look at IoT, I mean, the claim is over the next few years, there'll be over 50 billion devices that are connected to the internet. When they say devices, it's everything. It's laptops, uh, your cell phones, and so on and so forth. But a big portion of this are these IoT devices, right? And the scale at which these devices are getting connected is changing. I mean, earlier with computers, we were talking about millions, tens of millions of units. With cell phones, with smartphones, you're talking about billions of units. Now with IoT, we're talking about tens of billions of units that are getting connected. And depending upon who you talk to, Gartner and so many others, this IoT space is expected to generate in the order of trillions of dollars in economic value by 2025. Right? It's not even billions anymore. Now you're talking about trillions of dollars mm -hmm. of economic value. Um, so if you look at IoT, it's been going on for a long time, I and mean, the devices have been connected for a long time. One of the first IoT device, for example, was a bank ATM. That's an IoT device. The device is out in the field, it's collecting and sending data. Right? So what's making IoT popular today? It's what is, I would call it a perfect storm. 
lot of sensors that are available. They're smaller, they're cheaper, you can spread them everywhere, right? Um, wireless connectivity is easy, right? You can easily connect sensors all over the place. Um, the network's becoming strong enough, so as your sensors collect data and start sending data, the network's able to handle it. We now have the capacity to actually collect vast amount of data. Even 10 years ago, if somebody said, I have a petabyte of data, do something with it, mm -hmm. we wouldn't know what to do with it, how, how to collect it, and what to do with it. Today, we can, right? And not just collect it, but analyze it. So there's quite a few technologies that are available that are inexpensive, where you can actually analyze this vast amount of data. So that's a perfect storm. That's what's really pushing IoT. Uh, and making it so popular today. Um, <clears throat> so what's the value? What, what, do, what are we trying to do with IoT? The basic concept is simple. It's converting this data that we get from all of these devices and converting that into knowledge that creates value. And ultimately, it's all about value. So if you look at different types of devices, uh, you can have connected cars, connected health, connected home, the ones that are most, we are most popular. Uh, familiar with, we collect this data, we convert that into knowledge. So for example, a connected car can be converted into knowledge that tells you how the driver is, is, is driving that car. Right? Connected health can do automated diagnosis, diagnosis of, the, of the health of the person. Connected home detect when somebody is at home. And the value you create out of it, so in the case of connected car, maybe because you're a good driver, you get insurance discounts. Right, some of the insurance companies are starting to do that today. Uh, connected health, if something is going wrong with you, maybe you automatically alert your doctor that I need medical attention. In the case of connected home, if nobody's at home, may, the, the Nest thermometer will auto automatically adjust the temperature and save on energy costs. Right? So those are applications that are starting to develop. But all of these applications, a lot of these applications, are being built in silos. So basically you have silos of information where you co collect data, you do something with it, convert that into knowledge, and it works, right? And that's, that's the whole purpose. One of the common things that you're trying to do with the data platform is collect data across multiple silos and share information across these applications. So if the car could tell you when it was driving home, that could trigger your thermometer to turn the heat on, right? And that's actually available today. This is something that's possible today. Um, so that's the basic concept of now creating a common platform that spans multiple applications and allow data sharing across these applications. So if you look at the IoT <coughs> market, um, if you look at the IoT ecosystem, it's divided into basically three big segments. Right? There's a consumer IoT, which is what we are more familiar with, I mean the smartwatches, Fitbits, and so on and so forth. There's a government IoT, so smart cities, uh, the de defense sector, all of that is part of the government <coughs> IoT. And then the business side is enterprise, retail, manufacturing. And if you look at the value that each segment is trying to derive, the business side is where the most value is today. Right? The consumer side is the most popular. That's the biggest hype. But that also has the least amount of value. I think the consumer, the consumer IoT is still trying to figure out what that killer application is from the consumer to, that makes a consumer buy these devices. And I think the biggest consumer IoT device is this one. The most popular one is a smartphone. This is an IoT device, right? Mm. The biggest advantage of that is it can do multiple things. Most of the other IoT devices are single purpose devices that make them very expensive. But what I do is I'll focus a little bit more on the business side, and especially within the business side, focus more on the manufacturing side. Because if you look at manufacturing, so here this is about <coughs> 11 billion devices that have about $7.6 trillion in, a, in ROI that comes out of it. Out of those 11 dev billion devices, about a billion of them are going to be in manufacturing. 
just that space alone will produce about two and a half, three trillion dollars in ROI. Uh, that's the biggest benefit. And where does this benefit come from? If you look at a manufacturing line, right, collecting the data from the manufacturing line <coughs> helps with op op operational efficiency improvement. So you basically look at the operation of the, of the manufacturing assembly line and see how do I optimize it. The second part of it is making sure that it doesn't fail and the equipment doesn't fail. So preventing the, maintain preventing the failure and doing preventative maintenance on that equipment. And the third part of it is inventory management. If you know when the equipment's gonna fail, you don't have to keep a lot of inventory. You can do just-in-time inventory and save, mo save money on inventory management. So just touching back on the consumer and the government spaces, um, the consumer IoT space is pretty large. Um, devices every, everywhere you can think <coughs> of, wearable computing, your smart, the VR glasses, things in home automation, you can even monitor your pets, right? Your pets can have little devices connected to them where you know what they're doing, where they're going. This is the consumer IoT space. Um, I love to use this chart. This is a company called Libelium, and what they basically do is make sensors. So they put this chart together that says, what does a smart world look like? So when you talk about a smart city government space, this is basically what they're talking about is monitoring everything that is happening around you. Right? Monitoring the water all the way up to noise, noise monitoring and looking at the roads, road sensors and all those kind of things. This is basically the smart, smart city space. So there's a huge security and privacy issue here. How yes. <laughs> trying to address this seriously. Um, there, there is a huge security privacy thing uh, here most of everything that is being monitored is on the outside, right? So if there's cameras on the road, um, there's sensors tracking how many people are walking by and so on and so forth. Those are all considered uh, open, open available information. So all of this is non-private information, technically. And one of the things that- The issue that these are not all just sensors, Yeah, I mean, that, that is actually a pretty large security problem that exists today. Uh, in fact, there was this uh, pretty large DDoS attack that happened on the East Coast just, I think, a week or so ago. And that was essentially that somebody went in, hijacked all these IoT devices, and used those IoT devices to do a DDoS attack that shut down, I think, uh, quite a few websites on the East Coast for, for a day or so. So yes, yeah, security is a big problem. And I think maybe the Intertrust solution can really become a differentiator there that helps secure that end device and make sure nobody can actually hack into it and, and take it over, mm -hmm. essentially. But here, I mean, uh, all of these are open devices that, yeah, if, if somebody doesn't design them correctly, if, if they're not fully secured, they could cause an issue, definitely. And there'll be tens of billions of them out there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Definitely agree with you. But it's it's a fairly complex world. It's it's a lot happening here behind the scenes. And uh, the example that I had earlier of uh, a street lamp, I mean that's just one of them. There's a street lamp that has sensors on it. It can monitor everybody that goes back and forth. Right. All of your phones have a Bluetooth chip on it. So if you put a little beacon on that, on that uh, street lamp, as you walk by, that beacon knows you just walked by. And, it, it, and these things talk to each other. Right? You don't even have to do anything. They will know that you just walked by. So uh, that technology exists today. That, that's in play. That's what the retailers use, for example, to do a heat map of where people are going and what they're doing within the, uh, within the store. The street map might be those of you walk by or at least your phone walk. That's true, that's true. The phone walked by, exactly. Yeah, uh, I mean the basic concept is I think everybody knows, well everybody today carries a phone. Pretty much everybody carries a phone. And you can kind of correlate a person to a phone 
fairly easily. Uh, the personal graph people would tell you that here, right? <laughs> um, and here, I mean, they will detect that information and they can actually use it. And a lot of it is public information. So I think privacy and security is a big challenge. And it will evolve, I think, over a period of time. There is quite a bit of automated data collection that is happening today. In fact, just today, the FCC announced a new regulation that prevents um, your Comcast and AT&T of the world to uh, prevent them from collecting data about where you're going on your internet. Uh, that's a first step, right? That's the FCC. FCC cannot control the Googles and Facebooks of the world from collecting your data. And the Google knows everything about you. <laughs> and when you, when you go, now the phone will tell you, uh, you're going home, there's an accident two miles down the road. Right? They know, they know where you're going and where you live, so. Unfortunately, that's true. Okay. Um, Next step, shifting over manufacturing. And if you really look at a manufacturing plant, I mean, most of them are fully automated. You don't see people in manufacturing plants anymore. And all of these machines have hundreds of sensors that are constantly producing data. All the data is currently used within the manufacturing floor, so there are little controllers that look at the input coming in from that data and say, okay, I need to do something with this. So temperature sensor, there's a controller that's monitoring the temperature sensor. If it crosses a certain threshold, it says stop. If, if it never crosses a threshold, it keeps monitoring it, and that's it. Right? The data gets thrown away. The data is never collected. If something bad is happening somewhere, there's an alert that comes up, and maybe that alert gets collected. So that whole concept of the data getting thrown away, there's a term that manufacturers use. It's called dark data. Right? The data is available but never collected. And most manufacturing facilities, even the advanced manufacturing facilities, almost 90% of data is dark data, never gets collected. So where IoT platforms are coming in now, especially industrial IoT platforms, the concept is to convert that manufacturing dark data into actionable insights, do something meaningful with that data. And that is the, <coughs> the holy grail of industrial IoT. Um, so if you look at manufacturing business transformation, how do we do this? Right. Basically, one way of a manufacturing plant is very reactive. Right. Uh, let me use a more common example. Let's say you have a car. You're driving your car. And this is now 20 years ago. How do you know you need an oil change? Well, you don't. Your car just fails, and you go to the mechanic and say, oh, you need new oil. That's a reactive approach towards a manufacturing plant. The next step towards this is proactive. The proactive part is every 3,000 miles, you're going to take your car in for service and get the oil change. Right? Whether you need an oil change every 3,000 miles or not, you're going to do it because you don't want that car to fail. So you're being proactive about it at this point. But today's cars are predictive. So they will tell you when you, they need an oil change. So a car will tell you, I need an oil change in the next 500 miles. So there are sensors that are now built into the car that are predicting when that oil change is needed. Right? You transform that one more step, you're trying to become preemptive. And here I'll paint a world for you. Middle of the night, you're sleeping, your car drives itself to an oil change station, gets the oil change and comes back. That is preemptive, right? Not, nothing got affected, the car did it by itself. This is where manufacturing is going. That's a goal for manufacturing. Most of the manufacturing plants today are in this space. They're either reactive or proactive. They want to get predictive, they want to get preemptive. Right? That's basically, again, if you talk about what manufacturing or industrial IoT platforms are all about, it's moving manufacturing up that value chain. How do you do it? Um, we talked about intelligence from data. The first and the most important part is this collection of data. How do I first collect all of this information that's just getting thrown away today? And not only collect data from manufacturing, but collect it from various sources so they can actually play with each other. Right. Um, next part of it is analytics. Analyze the data in real time. 
analyze it, a analyze historical data, and convert that basically into information that can be used. Um, predictive analytics, it, like a car telling you when, when you need to go for an oil change, that's an example of predictive analytics. Next step is visualization, right? So you present this data to domain experts in a way that they can make sense out of it. And they can actually deduce information from, from historical data when it's visualized correctly. And that's a key step of most of these platforms as well. Right? And that's what helps with decision making. So the more you can do, uh, optimize this loop, the more advanced manufacturing gets. Right? So basically, if you go look at, there's probably about 10 um, different industrial IoT platforms out there today, they will all have some version of this. Collect, analyze, visualize, decide. Right? What is also changing now is instead of visualizing information, how do I automate this process? So the human being is involved during the visualization process. How do I automate that? Well, let's bring learning into place. So this is machine learning, artificial intelligence, and quite a few algorithms that can look at data and automatically create patterns for you, right? And then you now have a fully automated loop where human beings are not involved. But machines can only go so far. So the most of the platforms use a combination of the two, right? You still have to have the domain experts that are feeding information into these learning algorithms. And all of that helps basically continue the loop forward. Okay. Is this going too fast or uh, too, too detailed, too high level? Good. Good. Okay. So if I look at that chain, right, which is basically collect, analyze, visualize, learn, and then decide, what does a platform look like from that perspective? So again, we start off with a source of data. Data comes from various sources. It could be your mobile phones <coughs> and so on. It could be wind farms, cars, doesn't matter. Data gets into a common data store, <coughs> right? Um, ETL stands for extract, transform, and load. That's a uh, database term that's basically converting data into a format that is easy to manage and store. <coughs> Once the data is there, that's where you're analyzing it, you're deciding, making decisions, you're learning information, and you're presenting that to the end user, and that's the visualization piece, right? And then there's access controls and so on that, that go in there. But that's basically the platform. At a very, very high level, that's what a platform's doing. If you look at the Personograph platform, for example, it has most of these capabilities built into it. Uh, one other thing that we have to add on top of it for, especially for industrial IoT, is this concept of an edge agent. Um, how many here have heard the term fog computing? Yeah. Edge agent, so basically the concept is, you, everybody knows cloud computing. Cloud computing, you send data up to some server sitting in Virginia, it does some magic with it, sends your results back. Fog is the cloud brought down to you, right? So basic concept of fog computing is you're not sending the data up into the cloud. You have this little control box sitting right next to your device, right next to your system, and it's, it's making decisions for you right there. Edge analytics is another, or edge agents is another concept. It's basically the same concept. And what we are trying to do here is sending intelligence down to the agent, so like algorithms down to the agent, that can be run remotely within, within that space, right next to the device, making decisions right next to the device. Now, most of these agents don't have historical data, the perspective of other information, but some of the decisions can be made locally. The second thing the edge agent does is it compresses the data that's being sent. So if you have a manufacturing plant that is generating petabytes of data constantly, you cannot ship that over the wire into the cloud. So it will actually compress that data, send summary data over, uh, over the wire into the cloud as well. So that's another purpose of the edge agent. But the concept is simple. It's quick decisions right next to the machine. If this connection breaks for some reason, so let's say you're talking about a wind farm, 
and there's a big storm going through, so your 3G network goes down. The edge agent is still responsible for collecting all that data from the, from the wind turbine, and next time the connection comes back up, it will go back and sync that data back into the cloud, so it becomes a data buffer. Right, so all those capabilities are built straight into the edge agent. So that's a pretty big concept, especially in the industrial IoT space. Um, so if you look at a platform, uh, most of the platforms, the key value proposition for these platforms, um, collect dark data, right? That itself is a huge value to begin with. There's all this data that's getting thrown away. Um, correlate data from multiple sources, right? not just from a single source, but use data across multiple sources. Enable intelligent analytics. IBM Watson talks about cognitive uh, analytics. All those, all those are different terms that are used. Um, and then automate the learning and the decision making process. So any uh, industrial IoT platform that's out there, these, this is basically the value proposition chart you'll see for most of them. They'll all have different words around it, but the basic concepts are still the same. It's collect, analyze, visualize, decide. Right? That's basically the concept. Um, so I've been here at Intertrust now, I think for three weeks. So I'm learning quite a bit about Intertrust, what we do. And here's how I think we can create an Intertrust difference to this platform. And the first concept is the data lake. So we talked about data sharing, right? So the concept is how do I share data across multiple applications? Almost everybody in the industrial IoT world will not share data. They want to protect their data, right? So they all operate in this world where everything is a silo. That's it. Their data is their IP. They will not share that with anybody else. What we can do at Intertrust is bring this common data pool to them that can be used now for intelligent analytics, right? So they're not just using their data. They're using a common data pool. We can also bring some premium data to them. So this may be a data source that is available, it's not free, they want, they want to monetize the data, Intertrust can help them monetize it, and we use our DRM technology essentially to protect and make sure that whoever owns this data gets paid and the data is protected. Right. So that's, that's one concept uh, that I think is different compared to most of the other data platforms. An extension to this, is you will have some, again, some companies that will never ever want their data sitting along with anything else. They want their own, maybe an on-premise install, maybe their own private cloud, and they keep their data there. But they want to derive value from this. So again, what we are able to do at this point is maybe push algorithms down into their data space, run the algorithms there, bring the results back, so that way, this particular data lake is only using the learnings from that silo out there, but not really getting any of the proprietary data over. So it's, it's still a concept of data sharing, but you're not really sharing raw data anymore. What you're sharing is the learning from that data. And I think Gene Cloud's doing a, a great job with basically this concept, which is you don't bring the data to you, you send the algorithms down to the local source run the analytics there and just bring the results back. So that way you protect the privacy of whatever is there in that data space. So at least so far my learnings, that would be become basically our intertrust inter difference when we create this data platform. Okay. So that's what I have from a high level. I have <coughs> a significantly more technical representation of the same thing. I don't want to go into this unless you have specific questions, but I mean, that's IoT, or industrial IoT to be more exact. Yeah. Okay.